How many excited to be in God's house today? Come on. Yeah, I, I am so excited. I sense God, his power, his presence so much in this place today. I got a word shut up in my bones, man. How many are ready to receive the word of God today? Amen? I don't know. How many of y'all ready to receive the word of God today? Are you really ready? There's the response I'm looking for, man. I'm so excited. This teaching of David has been so fun for me. It really has. Diving into this character. And uh, if you missed any of these, you got to go online and catch up, man. Uh, we started with the young teenage shepherd boy seeing this man after God's own heart, even at that age, and why God chose him to be king of Israel. We followed his journey right to the battlefield where David fights Goliath, and he defeats him and becomes instantly like this household name, and stardom is on the horizon. He's the captain like of King Saul's army, leading people into battle, but that's very short-lived because of the insecurities and toxicities of Saul, and he gets really insecure about David. And for about seven or eight years, he's hunting David down. He's running through caves and and hiding from him, and this is a, a season of waiting for David. Um, then we find at the end of his season of waiting, um, the Lord fights his battles, and King Saul is removed from being the king, and David steps into what he was anointed to do 15 years previously. And there is, for a season, victory and success and favor on his life, man, and him and his mighty men actually do a lot of amazing things. And if you missed it, we actually talked about that. Today's actually like part five of the series. And for those of you who are like, wait a second, I've been here every week. This is only the fourth. Okay, I, this is too much in David's story that I had to do a sermon drop online. And so on Friday night, I dropped a message on YouTube and our Facebook. So if you didn't get that, you want to go back and watch that because we talked about David and his mighty men. We talked about David's leadership, his characteristics, his qualities that really attracted the mightiest of men to follow him. And you ought to go check that out. Today, we're going to be covering the second most famous story of David's life. A lot of you know the, the first, like the, the most famous story of David's life. We already covered it. It's David versus Goliath. The second most popular story of David's life. Y'all know it, right? It's David and Bathsheba, that's the one, okay? Before any of you tisk or click your tongue at David for the, the mistake that he made, the scripture says, be careful if you think you're standing firm because you're ready for a fall, okay? So we need to be very careful in how we perceive David in this moment because every single one of us has fallen, will fall. We just need to learn from this example of faith. 2 Samuel chapter 11 is where we're going to pick up the story today, you guys. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. So this is a time very, all the kings are in the battlefield, but David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but check this out, David remained at home. He remained in Jerusalem. And one evening, he got up from his bed and walked around on the rooftop, and it was probably after midnight because mama said nothing good happens after midnight. <laughs> and he says from, uh, from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. She was naked. And the woman was very beautiful. Let me tell you something about the scriptures here. The, this is not sugarcoat. The Bible does not sugarcoat things or even people's appearance. So when the Bible says someone was beautiful, you can be assured, that's a beautiful woman. When the Bible adds on very, on top of beautiful, what, what it's saying is she was a smoke show, bro. She was like, <laughs> she was a hottie with two T's. I don't know how you want to describe it, but this girl was like, she was all that, okay? And naked, by the way, okay? Anyway, and David, <laughs> David was like, and here's, look, look, again, don't tisk at this, you guys. Here's, it's, not, it's, it's not, you know, what happens when you are tempted, because every one of us are going to be tempted. It's, it's what you do in the temptation. Are you going to linger there? Do you lean in there? Do you kind of keep looking? Do you keep clicking on that website? Do you not put up the blockers that you need? What do you do when temptation comes? And here is David. There it was, and he lingered, and he leaned in, and he sent someone to find out about her and he comes and says, Oh, that's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers 
to go get her. I want to have that. I got to get, I, she's got to come. So she came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness and she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. David, we can't hide this one. Like this is, this is coming out and, and I don't know what you, what you want me to, to do here, David. I, you guys, what happened to this man that we've been studying for like a month now? Like this man after God's own heart, this amazing, you know, sweet singer and worshiper of Israel, this guy who had so much character and so much passion and followed God and wrote the Psalms. Like what, what happens to men who, and women who sacrifice their integrity for moments of pleasure, who sacrifice their families for momentary thrills? What in the world? How do we get to this place from on fire for God to being tripped up, sacrificing everything. I like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. He's a pastor and a theologian. He says this about David's sin with Bathsheba and about our temptation moments. He says, at this moment of temptation, God is quite unreal to us. Like he's not even real. He loses all reality and only desires for the creature, the thing we're craving itself. That's the only thing that's real. The only reality is the devil. And check this out. Satan does not here fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. It's in the moment of temptation, you guys, where, where in, in, leaning into it and lingering there for too long, we don't, we're not like hating God in that moment. We love God. We love his word. We love his presence. We are our people of faith. It's in that moment that's, that God just becomes unreal to us and we forget how good he is. We forget who he's called us to be. We forget what he's called us to do or even commanded us to do and we are filled with forgetfulness of God. In this time where David should have been in battle, he was caught in the bedroom. Here's the, here's the truth, you guys. Our greatest battles happen when we're bored, not busy. I swear the, that's the greatest battles happen right there. So often we think busyness is a bad thing. Insure, being hurried and overwhelmed and distracted, those aren't good things. But being busy with good things is a good thing, you guys. Finding something to give your life to is a good thing, especially men. <laughs> men need a cause, man. Men are like trucks. We drive better, straighter, and truer when we're carrying a heavy load. Can I get an amen, man? All right? Amen. Our most difficult times aren't when we're going through hard moments. It's not. That's not uh, hard times create dependent people. You, you don't get proud when you're dependent on God. When you're in survival mode, like David was running in the caves and stuff like that, survival mode keeps you humble. It keeps you low. But pride happens when everything is swinging in your direction. Pride happens when you get that promotion. Pride happens when you get a little prestige, a little bit of money, a little bit of influence. You get some better stuff. That's where pride keeps, creeps in, where everybody's chanting, David, 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 and what you do, you don't think that you have to do the things that you did to get you where God got you. You stop doing those things, and David was bored. He was bored, but why was he bored? Why was David not at war? What happened in this phase of David's life at about 50 years old here in this, in this reading? Did he get to a place where he was just like, man, I'm gonna be in pajamas and sports center. This is my life, man, I'm good. Did he get, I don't know, what happened in David's life? Was he injured? Was he injured in battle and staying home or was he, uh, was he filled with pride? Did he think too highly of himself? Like he didn't need to go out there and do the, do the fighting thing anymore. The Bible actually tells us in 2 Samuel, gives us some insight as to why David actually wasn't on the battlefield when kings were usually on the battlefield. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, 20 and on, those are like the back to the future chapters because it's not, it's not written in order like chronologically. Those chapters, it starts to call back to David's earlier years and battles and gives us some more insight. So let me show you 2 Samuel 21 where it does this and it gives us more insight to this phase and season of David's life. It says, once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel. And when David, has, uh, David and his men were in the thick of battle, check this out, David became weak and exhausted. Say exhausted. He was tired, man. 
It says, Ishbenab was a descendant of the giants. Y'all know about Goliath the giant he fought, but there are actually a lot of giants that David fought and the, the 30, the mighty men, fought a, a lot of different battles and giants. And this one, his bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, so just the tip of it. So he's this big dude, and he was armed with a new sword, it says. He cornered David, and check it out. He was about to kill him. He was about to kill the giant slayer, the warrior of Israel, but Abishai. Come on, you need Abishai in your life. If you remember Abishai, Abishai last week, we saw him show up, and he was like, I'll put a spear right through Saul. Just tell me. Give me the word. You need Abishai in your life because Abishai comes to his rescue and kills the giant. And David's men declared from that day, look what happens. Hey, David, <laughs> time out here. We ain't as young as we used to be. We're not as fast as we used to be, as agile. You are not going out to battle with us again. Why should we risk snuffing out the light of Israel? Like, you're too important. You know, when we were younger, we would just go off into battle, man. We would do crazy things, David. We would fight whoever, whenever. But we're a little older now, and we need to get a little more practical. There comes a time in every man's life that he has to face the facts that he's not as young as he used to be. He's not the man he used to be. Here, David is almost 50 years old. Hey, David, you're not as young. You're not as strong. You're not as fast. Uh, we don't need you to fight in the war anymore. Uh, we need you to just, hey, stay home. Deal with the courts, the judges, the ruling. Uh, and every man right now is feeling it, right? You're feeling it for David because that's a hard pill to swallow for, for a man. It really is. Every man is feeling for David. You're, you're, he, because he's, he's the giant killer, right? Almost getting killed by a giant. Here's, it was sung, David, Saul killed his thousands and David killed his tens of thousands. This is where David got his affirmation. This is where David got his identity. This is where David received meaning. And now he's being looked at by his friends saying, you're not good enough for this part anymore. And, in, and this was a reality. This is a reality of every man and every woman. You'll get to a place where you do not have the capacity that you used to have. You don't have the energy you used to have. You don't have the strength or the intellect. Like things just go in the other direction. And so I want you to picture this scene, okay? Picture back to the scene where David is at home in Jerusalem. And all of his buddies are fighting a war. And he's got to be thinking to himself, oh, man, I wish I was there. I wish I was out there fighting, man, with my boys. I miss the camaraderie. I miss the campfires. I miss going out there. Oh, man, I wish I could be out there with them. And David is restless. And in his restlessness, David gets up out of his bed, and he goes to take a walk on his rooftop. And there he sees this naked hottie. And, he's, and he says to himself, self? Uh, you ain't feeling much like a man right now, but you know how to feel like a man. Oh, you, you might not con be able to conquer wars nowadays, but you can conquer women still. See, listen to me, listen. There was something unfinished and incomplete inside of David's soul that he had to reach outside of himself to find his affirmation, validation, and comfort in yet another woman. Nobody wakes up one night for a stroll and goes, you know what, I'm going to commit adultery today. David didn't like just, just get up out of nowhere and just be like, you know what, well, this is the day. I'm going to ruin my kingdom. Just like many don't wake up and go, hey, this is the day. I'm going to cheat on my coworker, cheat on my wife and my coworker today. This is the day. You don't wake up and go, hey, this is the day. I I'm going to get addicted to pills today, man. That's what I'm going to do. That's my own one goal today. No, nope. it's a slow fade. It's a slippery slope. And it happened for David a long time ago. Let me show you a little bit inside of where his thought process began in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, let's go back. Because when he became king, when he first became king, he was becoming more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with him. And now Hiram, king of Tyre, he sent envoys to David. Like they were paying him tribute. So they were giving him cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons. And he even built a big old house for himself, big old palace. Man, he's living it up. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. And look at this. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives. 
there's something. See, it, it starts out as a very small bad decision, but those small bad decisions, please hear me, those small bad decisions you're making today is going to lead to a catastrophe if you don't watch yourself. It just started with a little looking for him, I'm sure, a little pornography here and there. And then when he got the power and influence to do it, he got a little bit more. And see, he fell for the lie. David fell for the lie that, that this harem of women, not, a, not a, it, a harem of women could not satisfy his sexual urges. And here's the lie of culture. The lie of culture is still today. To soothe your sex drive, you got to satisfy it. Go ahead. That's what you do. That's what you, you, you're just human. It's just human nature. Satisfy that sex drive. It doesn't matter if you watch porn. It's just natural stuff. Anyway, it doesn't matter if you masturbate. It's just natural. You all to do that. Everyone should masturbate. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy right now. Okay, I'm sorry. This is, I just, I got one mode. It's real. Okay, it's just going to be real. We'll get to know each other a little bit more over the months and, and years to come. But, but this is a lie of the enemy. This is a lie that in order to soothe it, you satisfy it. Here's the truth. The more you satisfy it, the more you crave it. Just like any other appetite that you are familiar with, the more you, you satisfy the appetite, the more you create a need for that appetite. And if you're thinking right now, well, this is just culture, right? Back then, that's what kings did. That's what all they did. They just, they, they kind of had concubines and wives. Not God's people, this was never, look, it was never part of God's plan for us to live such sensual, sexually immoral lives. It was never God's plan. Let me show it to you. It's not in your notes, but Deuteronomy chapter 17, before they even entered the promised land, God knew that they were going to want a king to rule over them. And he tells them in Deuteronomy, he says, hey, when you're going to enter the land the Lord has given you, when you ask for a king, make sure he says this. Make sure he's the one I choose, first of all. But secondly, make sure he's an Israelite. Can't be of the native born, all right? And then he says, make sure they don't have a lot of horses and stables. He can't, he can't get a lot of horses and stables. And, and then he says this. He says, make sure that you don't go back to Egypt because I delivered you from there. But check it out. He must not make, take many wives. He can't, or, or else his heart will be led astray and he can't accumulate silver and gold. This is David. A, I'm telling you, it was just a slow fade for David. Just small decisions here and there that led up to this crazy catastrophe. And it was one, by the way, that we're going to see in the story of David in the weeks to come that, that got, that spirit got into his son, Solomon. That the way that David treated women and the way that he satisfied his needs and his false sense of masculinity that his son was watching. And as his son led, and he led well for a while, but what took Solomon out was the same sin that was taking his dad out. And he gathered to himself a whole bunch of women that lived in foreign nations and their idols destroyed Israel of King Solomon. And you don't know who's watching and the eyes that are watching us. And David is in, look, so, so now you can see David, David is in a very vulnerable spot. He's in a vulnerable season of his life. And, and not only is he vulnerable, but he's not accountable. All of the king's men are out to war, and here he is, unaccountable, vulnerable, like so many men who are unfinished today. Unfinished men who who try to reach outside of themselves to find someone or something to complete something very broken inside of them. There's a book called Father by God, written by John Eldridge. If you, if you haven't read it and you're a guy in this room, I encourage you to read that book, Father by God, by John Eldridge. And in it, he goes over the six stages of masculinity. That there are six stages every man goes through, and he kind of he kind of sees David as the main example, but it can be seen in every man's life, these six stages. And they overlap, and there's aspects in every stage and in each other. But here's the main idea I want you guys to see. Come on, look up here with me. A boy becomes a man only through the active intervention of his father and the fellowship of men. It cannot happen any other way. Each stage of a man's life has lessons to be learned. And, and, and each stage can be wounded and cut short and leaving a man, a growing man, underdeveloped in his soul. And we wonder why a man folds 
in his 45s, around 45 or 50 years old, like a tree toppled by a, a stormy wind in the night. When in the morning we go and inspect that tree that's leaning over, we go and inspect it, and we see the roots didn't go d- down deep to the earth. Or maybe it was because of drought or disease that something was wrong in this tree that it toppled over because of the storm, much like the inner life of a lot of men today, incomplete and unfinished. Let me give you the six stages of masculinity today. Ladies, you can apply this yourself, but I need to, I need to speak to the men in the room today because we are in a very, we're in a serious condition in our world. Here's the first stage of, of masculinity. The first stage is called boyhood. Boyhood. We all are familiar with that. Above all else, it's the time of being a beloved son. It's a time where you enjoy being the apple of your father's eye. It's a time of affirmation. And what we need in this stage and in this season beyond anything else is the father's love. That's what we need. We need to know that we are loved, that we are beloved, that we are the apple of his eye, that we are affirmed by our father. The second stage is called cowboy. Now, it's, it actually should be called shepherd, and he kind of explains that in the book, but, it, but because that, you can't call it shepherd because that word has been hijack, hijacked by commercial, you know, Christmas of our, of our Western culture, and when you hear shepherd, you hear a man in a robe with a cane or something. It does not compute because shepherds in the biblical times were grungy, gritty, strong men, and what they did was... A, majorly difficult job, so we can't use the word shepherd. We got to use a terminology that you're more familiar with. So, so we'll call this stage the cowboy. Around the period of adolescence, when you're around 13 years old, uh, it runs to probably the early 20s. It's a time of learning lessons of the field. This is where the story of David picks up in the Bible account. He's in the shepherd field, and he's fighting bears and lions and defending his sheep. This is where uh, maybe you learn to throw a curveball. You, uh, you learn to lift weights. You, you, you learn how to drive a car. Maybe even you get your first car. And then the, the world and the horizons of the world kind of open up to you. You go on adventures alone in the woods, right? You go on adventures with your buddies, maybe to another state, maybe to even another country. Uh, is, is that's, every man sh- shares the same core question, though. This is very important for you women to even know, that every man, every man shares the same core question. It's this, do I have what it takes? Every man, do I, do I have what it takes to be a man? Do I have what it takes to be a father? Do I have what it takes to lead my family? Do I have what it takes to be a husband? Every man has that question. And it's at this stage of life and of adventure that we start to test that. Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? Sometime in the late teens, there emerges the third stage, which is the young warrior. The young warrior. And the stages overlap. Again, some aspects are always in the life of a man, like this stage. I don't care if you're six or 60 years old. There's always going to be a warrior living in the heart of every man because we are created in the image of a warrior God. Come on, man, say amen. amen. But a man, uh, he may go off to trade school, mission field. He encounters evil face to face, and he learns how to defeat it. In this stage, he might join the Navy. He might become a math teacher, battle for the hearts of young men in the inner city. But a man needs a mission. That's crucial that a man gets a mission. And and, and it's even more crucial that he learns how to fight the kingdom of darkness in this world. Passivity and masculinity are fundamentally at odds with each other. To be a man, you must learn how to take courage, how to take action, how to go into battle. He must learn how to be a warrior. You must learn it. And at this stage is where you typically go to stage four, which is you become a a lover. And though it would be best for the man and even for the woman that he stay a warrior for a certain amount of time and learn that stage because too many young men They don't get their questions answered as a young cowboy or as an uncertain warrior, and they don't have a mission to live for, and they go and put all that on the woman, thinking that in her, I can satisfy all of my needs. But a lover comes to offer his strength to a woman, not to get it from her. Come on, somebody say amen. Are you hearing me, man, today? Okay. In this stage, he discovers poetry and passion 
he actually discovers that, that passion and poetry and these things are actually more closer to the truth than his logic and his reason. He awakens to life. He awakens to beauty. He opens himself up spiritually more than he ever thought. He may start to, like David, he may become a romantic. And this is much more than, than like women, you guys. This isn't just about women. This is about passion, about your depth of your heart, where service for God is overshadowed by intimacy with God. Then and only then is he ready to become a king and to rule in the kingdom. See, the crisis in our world, in our businesses, in our churches, in politics, in our homes today is men have been given power, but they are unprepared to handle it. I know, man, I love you, but you need, you need to get beat up today, okay? The time of ruling is a tremendous test of character. You know what we call midlife crisis today is just a man coming into a little money and a little influence and trying to go back and recover what was missed in boyhood, buying himself a lot of toys, or what was missed in a cowboy stage and going off on adventures. See, what we have now in this world, what we have now is a world of unfinished men. Boys, mostly, walking around in men's bodies with men's jobs and families, finances and responsibilities. I don't know exactly where in the life of David he was unfinished. I can read the stories and kind of a, maybe glean a little bit that maybe in his boyhood he didn't get the affirmation, the love that he needed or maybe somewhere he that, that there was something missing. I don't know exactly where it happened with David, but I know where it happened with me. And I want to just, every, every man that is in here today, you need to know every one of us are broken to some degree because our fathers are not perfect and they were not perfect. They didn't, they, they didn't always make the best decisions and neither did we. And so there's a, there's a measure of incompleteness in something that is unfinished inside of our soul that causes us men Hear me, we know it to be true. It causes us to reach outside of God's design to grab things that aren't for us, to satisfy something that is incomplete, that is unfinished. For me, I, I wasn't raised with a father in my home. I did not get affirmation, love, none of, none of that. Um, even my mother, mother was very absent, very non-present and uncommitted and unintentional and, and did not care, did not, did not associate. It was, I know where I was unfinished and where the Lord had to come in and heal and bring wholeness and healing to my life. Every one of us are a little bit unfinished. And David, his unfinished soul caught up to him. The sixth stage, let me just get to it. The sixth stage is called the sage. The sage. His kingdom, at this stage, the kingdom of a man may shrink he may move into a smaller home. The kids have all left the house and stuff. And although his income may decrease, his influence should increase. Please hear me, those of you that are in your late 40s, 50s, or above men, women in this room. This is not the time to pack up and retire for Phoenix. This is not the time for you to kind of go rest on your laurels. Like at the time where men feel at their weakest and at their least contribution is actually the time that you can make your biggest contribution to people and lives. Because your mission now is to use your experience and your wisdom to shape and refine the men around you and the women around you and others around you. They need the sage, the experience, the wisdom. Back to David, all those mad, that these bad decisions, they add up to this catastrophic decision. And one by one, he tries to cover them up. You guys have, most of you read the story. If you haven't, go reread it again. He goes, he's like, I got a plan. I'm going to trick Uriah. Come home. He's going to sleep with her. And he's going to be like, oh, wow, good job. Congratulations, Uriah. You're a dad. You know, so that was his whole plan. He's like, okay, no one's ever going to know. This can be, I'll just continue to be the man after God's own heart. I'll continue to be the leader and king of Israel. And no one will, will have to know. And Uriah, by the way, some of you guys don't know who Uriah was. Uriah, hear me, Uriah, Uriah was one of David's 30 mighty men. He was, he was one of David's close, loyal brothers. And this is what sin will do and temptation will do when you slide down this slope. You will betray your very own core values. As a warrior himself, as someone who fought and bled with these men, loyalty is something that was extremely valued to the soldier and the warrior. And here is David, one of his 30, 
One of his mighty men, one of his men that he fought and bled with, he betrays his own core values of loyalty to this man. And because he, was, he wouldn't sleep with Bathsheba, his own wife, he concocts this plan to send Uriah into the front line, lines. He writes a letter to Joab, his general, and says, put him on the front lines and get him killed. And, and he does. And he thought it was good and everything was going to be fine. And 2 Samuel chapter 11 says this, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, which was seven days, David had her brought to her house. Because, you know, earlier than seven days is too soon. You know what I mean? Just too soon. And then it says she became his wife and bore him a son. But these nine words carry tremendous weight and faith, don't they? But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. He thought he got away with it. No one knew, but the thing that he did in secret displeased the Lord. You know, when Satan tempts us, he never presents the consequences, does he? He'll just show you the thrills, the excitement, the, the, the fun, but he'll never tell you what is going to happen to you further down the road if you keep going. He'll never tell you that he's tempting you to drink alcohol. He'll never tell you about the worst morning of your life that you're going to have here shortly. Never will. He'll never tell you if you continue to live this way, you're going to lose your entire family and your career. You're going to ruin your life. He never will. He'll never tell you that just that little bit of pornography is actually going to twist your mind and your attraction so much that you'll be chasing tail your whole life instead of finding a good woman. He'll never tell you that. He'll just let you get all twisted up in his lies and his scheme. And David had consequences. 2 Samuel chapter 12 tells us the consequences. It says, this is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, David, I'm going to bring up calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I'll take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he'll sleep with your wives in broad daylight. We're going to talk about this kind of, this instance next week. You did it in secret, but I'll do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. By doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord. The son born to you will die. This was the consequence of David's decision, of David's sin. So what do we do when sin comes knocking at our door? What do we do when temptation is lurking and the enemy is setting traps before us. I love what John Owen said. John Owen said, be killing sin or it'll be killing you. So what do we do, you guys, when sin comes knocking at our door? What can we learn from the life of David here? Take some notes from you guys. Here's the first thing you got to do. Number one, run. <laughs> run. Get out of there. David had the opportunity to run. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 11 with me again in verse 3. When he sent someone to find out who Bathsheba was, when she was, he was looking at her from his you know, his rooftop, he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. And note, when you give someone's name, you usually give their lineage. And he kind of sneaks in. <laughs> and the wife of Uriah, David, that's your boy. That's your buddy. That's, 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 that's Uriah. That's the guy that you've ate with, you fought with, you bled with. That's Uriah. This goes totally over David's head because, listen, God was unreal to him, Right? Total forgetfulness of God, total forgetfulness of his value. And the only thing in the moment of temptation, because he lingered and he leaned in, the only thing that was real was the creature herself. He didn't take the opportunity to run when dealing with temptation. All throughout the scriptures, you know, it's really funny. When dealing with like, like sin and, and even some temptations and the enemy, the Bible all throughout the scripture tells us to fight the good fight of faith. You are more than conquerors in Christ. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God. Hey, put on the full armor of God and stand firm then. And, and all these, all, we get all this, but when it talks about sexual sin and sexual temptation, 1 Corinthians 6 and 18 tells us, flee from sexual. Never does it say fight sexual immorality. It says flee from sexual immorality. You are not to fight. Listen to me. You are not to fight against sexual immorality. You are not to fight against the temptation of lust and pornography. Don't fight that. You will lose every time. Let me say it like this. If you don't run, you will fall. You, you, don't, you don't fight temptation. You flee 
from temptation. You don't flirt with temptation, you flee from temptation. A lot of young people today don't understand the concept of sexual immorality and we're living in this world that is so sensual, so twisted and distorted where they say even, oh, that's just a piece of paper. Who cares about it? Like God knows my heart and I'm like, we're, we're in love. I, I kind of agree with you. Look, it, it is just a piece of paper. The ink on that paper doesn't matter. You know what does? The blessing of God is what matters. And God does not give you a command or does not give you his commands and his will as restrictions to your life. He's not a bummer type of God trying to make your life miserable and boring. He's trying to bless you. He's trying to protect you. Like the guardrails on a mountain that you're driving is protecting you from a cliff you're about to fall off. This is God's heart for his children. Run from sexual, don't, don't flirt with it. Run from it, flee from it. And the reason why I think the Bible says like flee and run from sexual immorality, don't mess with it, is because sexual immorality opens up a host of other sins. Look at David's life, lying, cheating, manipulating, murder. It all started, look here, it all started with just a look. Just a look, it was just a look. Hey, it's just a click, just a little pornography, it's just innocent, it's just innocent, just a little bit of this, it's just a taste. Just a little bit. That's where it starts. And those small decisions will lead up to your catastrophe. It'll lead up to the fall of your respect. It'll lead up to the crumbling of your marriage and your home. If you don't start running. Get wise, man of God, and run from that thing. I hope you women are taking something today, but I felt like I needed to talk to my men today, okay? You're getting something, right, ladies? I'm, you're, you're, you're applying this to you as well? I hope so. Here, number two. Run, and then number two, resist resist. So, so let me ask you a question. What are you doing actively to resist sin, temptation, and the enemy in your life? We call them precautions, right? Because it's pre the caution. It's before <laughs> the caution happens. Do you have any pre for the cautions? Like, like when, it, when it happens, because it's going to happen, you know, when you see what you didn't want to see, but it was there. You know what I mean? What was she doing anyway? Bathsheba. Here's, <laughs> here, so she's, she's bathing up there. She's got to know. There's a lot of modesty principles in scriptures for Israelite women. She's got to know that's the king's palace. That's his porch right there. And she's up here in plain sight. You know what she's doing. She's doing the same thing that you do when you wear that top. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> now, look, I, I'm, I'm just saying she wasn't completely innocent and all, but David was obviously the aggressor here, the one who went after her and, and chased her and committed. Like, like David was definitely the, the aggressor, but y'all need some pre. What are you doing? Do you have some... Do you have the blocks on your phone? Do you have the accountability partners? Do you have someone that has your passwords? Do you, do you, what are the pre's to the cautions? You need to learn how to resist it to the furthest degree possible. Stay away from that thing. Proverbs chapter five, verse eight actually tells us, whole chapter, you ought to read, men ought, and when, you ought to read Proverbs five and six at least every month. Every month, read Proverbs five and six. This is talking about adultery. It says, keep a path far from her. Don't even go on that side of town. What you doing on that side of town, okay? You don't even need to be there. Get away from that. Do not go near the door of her house. Stick, get some, resist, resist, resist. So run, resist. Number three is what I hope we'll do today is repent. David hid for a long time. He, he, he stayed in the darkness, in the shadow. This man after God's own heart the sweet singer of Israel was now living a lie, faking his existence in a minor key, worshiping in church like everything was okay, serving like everything was okay. David wrote in the Psalms about this in Psalm 32. He wrote this. When I refused to confess my sin, look what happened. I felt it in my body. Some of you feel that today. Some of you have this, have this secret, have this shadow thing, have this hidden thing going on. 
and you feel it like in your body is just draining your energy is draining and i groaned all day long he said day and night god your hand of discipline was heavy on me my strength evaporated like water in the summer heat and some of you feel like that today you feel like like you're just being drained and then you all know the story you should go reread it god sends nathan when he, when he thought everything was fine, I probably had a point in his life where, where yeah, he was, he was able to pretend well enough, but he knew what he knew, and his body was wasting away. And he's like, oh, I'm out of it. God sends Nathan and brings into the light that which was hidden in the darkness. Confronts him with it. 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is how David responds to Nathan. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. He said, I, I don't care what people think. I don't care what, what the world says is right or wrong. I don't care if they say it's good and it's natural. I don't care what the media says. I don't care what popular opinion says. I know in my heart, God, that I've sinned against you, Lord. Uh, here's the thing. Here's the temptation. Because if you just, just take one step to the other side, you can, you can be in a camp of people that say, hey, it's just natural. It's good. You're good. You're fine. It's okay. It's okay to live this way. It's okay to make those decisions. It's okay to go against the grain of creation. It's okay to do all that. Just one sidestep. And here is the heart of David, repentant, staying in the light when he can have easily stepped back in the dark. And he says, no, no, no. I'm not going to act like this is okay. I know in my heart that I haven't, I'm not, I'm not repenting because they say it's right or wrong or because they say it's good or bad. I know I have sinned against God. I have sinned. I've stepped out of the boundaries. I've displeased the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. And that is, that is the response of a loving father to anyone who stays in the light, does not hide their deeds of darkness, does not try to put on a mask and act like they're something that they are not. When you are living in a way that displeases God, this is what God does. He says he washes us, purifies us, cleanses us of all unrighteousness. No, 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 you're not going to die. You're forgiven. And I pray that something shifts in your heart today. And after the repentance, number four, is refocus. It's refocus. It's, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not who, I'm not that mistake. I'm not my past. I'm not, I'm not who they say I am. I love what 2 Samuel chapter 2 says to the be bewilderment of everyone in the palace. It says on the seventh day, the child died. So it actually happened. The consequence of the sin, please listen to me, look up here real quick, look. So you lost your marriage. It happened. That was a consequence. You lost your job. I get it. I get it. That was a consequence. You lost respect of some relationships. Maybe even your children are not looking at you the way that you want them to look at you right now. I get it. This is the consequence that we cannot get beyond. We cannot get beyond the consequence. But here's what David did. He got up and I'm speaking to every heart of man or woman in this place who is feeling the sting of consequence and is staying low, living in your past, living in your mistakes, living in your brokenness when God has forgiven you, has washed you, has cleansed you from all unrighteousness. It's time to get up. And he says, after he washed himself, he put on lotions and he changed his clothes. It's a picture of just, of leaving the, the past behind and becoming new he went into the house of the lord and he worshiped he refocused he wasn't going to stay in his mistake in his past in the darkness he wasn't even going to stay in the consequence he was going to walk from there better that's not my identity that's not who i am i'm not that mistake I'm, 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 I'm not that divorcee. I'm not that addict. I'm not that broken. I'm not that, I'm not that. I'm gonna refocus because I'm the apple of your eye, daddy. I'm, I'm beloved. I, I am a righteous in you. I'm refocusing on you today. Can I pray that over you? Can we bow our heads all over this place and close our eyes together? Some of you are here today, men and women together, but you know in your heart, in your soul, there is something unfinished. 
There is something incomplete. And I want you to know that you are in good company today. Every single one of us know the feeling, know the sentiment. We are unfinished souls living in a world of imperfection, mentored and parent, parented by imperfect pe people. For every one of us have a degree of unfinished, have a degree of brokenness. If you're here today and that's you, and you want to be made whole, you want to be made complete today, this is the good news of the gospel, the only, the only one who can satisfy your soul. It's not another fix. It's not another relationship. It's not another fling. It's not another job. It's not another mission. It's not any of that stuff. It's only in Christ. And I, I believe that some of you are feeling the tug of the Spirit right now. Like, like that void in your soul, can. it was meant, God-shaped size, meant for your Creator, meant for Jesus Himself to step into that place of your soul and mend and heal and restore and redeem and finish a good work inside of you. If you're here today and maybe you've never made a decision like that to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, surrendering your life to Him, or maybe you need to do it again, I'd love for you to make that decision today, man. Today, today, today would love for you to make that decision. I'm not gonna have you come up to the front. I, I just wanna pray with you right where you are. If you're here and you're ready for a fresh start, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. So with every head bowed and eye closed, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, if you're ready for a fresh start, if you're ready for God to begin that work of the inner soul, come on, today's the day. Be bold. One, two, three. Lift up your hand and say, I surrender. I need Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. I want a fresh start. Yes, yes, yes. Leave it up for me. Come on. Lift it high. I want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jesus. All over here. All over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. In the back, to Praise you, Jesus. Amen. All over this place. Go ahead and put your hands down for a moment. Can I help you with some words to pray and just talk to Jesus together? Let's say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I don't want to live apart from you anymore. I don't want to try to find fulfillment, satisfaction outside of you anymore. I was made for you. Today, I surrender the control of my life. Jesus, I declare, tell him, you are my Lord, my Savior, and my God. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. God, I pray over every person right now who has secrets, shadows, and dark things. God, I pray that as your light, the light of your word has exposed it, that they, we don't slip back into a cave of secrecy or darkness, but that we would stand in the light and repent. I know I've displeased you, God. I have sinned against you, God. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Help me, God, to live for you in a broken and unfallen world, to run to resist God, to repent. And today, we refocus on you, not on our past, not on our mistakes, not on even the temptation. God, it's all overshadowed by your glory, your greatness, your goodness. We focus on you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, if you receive that, will you give God some praise, church? Amen.